Let us warmly welcome our guests to the stage. Thank you. It's an awfully quiet audience. Goodness gracious. Oh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're delighted to have Director Mulvaney here. Director and acting director thank Mulvaney. Thank you very much. That's a fabulous tie, by the way. Well, thank you. Those are some uh, sweet like socks. Yeah, this is my, have a look, uh, everybody. My, this is my guacamole socks. <laughs> I was telling Eric before I came out here that I always, uh, I forget the days that I'm going to speak and be on stage, and I have some socks that are not appropriate to wear in public, um, and I was glad that these are not one of them. Those of you who don't think that Director Mulvaney has a lot on his plate with two jobs should have been with us backstage moments ago. <laughs> He's in the midst of the legislative process working, no less, if I'm not mistaken, four phones. Three phones. Pretty much. Okay, three, three phones. phones. Pretty much at the same time. Yeah. It was impressive. Uh, but, and, but not very productive. So, as is well, often the case. We'll see what happens while we're up here on That's, stage. And There's a vote on the Senate floor right now that it's sort of a, <clears throat> we're not sure how it's going to end up. So by the time we get off of the stage, I'll know whether or not the $15 <laughs> billion dollar rescission package is passed or not. So, other than that. On that note, why don't we tell people here a little bit about the nature of your day-to-day -day executive life, as it were. How do you divide your time between the Office of Management and Budget and the Bureau, I'm, I'm going to go with your, yeah, your, 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 your title you. for the, the Bureau for, yes. of Consumer Financial Protection on the other. You know, it's, Eric, it's just like any other executive position, right? You sort of manage to where the need is. Um, and I, so you, well, it's supposedly it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday at, uh, at the Bureau and Tuesday, Thursday and some weekends at, or vice versa at OMB. Um, really what it is is at any particular time, what's on fire is what you deal with. And then you hope that you put together a good enough team where not that many things catch on fire. And we've been very successful in doing that. Um, the management team at the Bureau has been uh, extraordinary. The, um, one of the, the, the best and most pleasant surprises I had going into the Bureau, of course, for those of you who follow politics, know that the Bureau is a fairly uh, politically charged uh, entity because of its, its origins. Um, I was expecting a lot more pushback than I got. And what I was pleasantly surprised by when I got to the Bureau was that uh, of the 1,700 permanent career employees who were there, the, 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 the vocal minority that really hated me and wanted to set me on fire was, was minimal. And that most folks just wanted to be good bureaucrats. And that was extraordinarily helpful. When, you, when you're in the bureaucracy, which is apparently what I am now, what you want is professionals who can work as hard for the Obama administration on the last day as they do in the Trump administration on the first day, and then work as hard for the next administration uh, when, that, when that administration takes over. You can't have a bureaucracy that picks and chooses when it wants to come so to that work. So there was no deep state at the CFPB? Not, not as much as I was worried about, and so we actually got a lot better product a lot more quickly than I expected, and it's been a lot less burdensome than I expected. How often do you talk with the president? It depends. Um, today, a couple times. I could go weeks at a time uh, without seeing him, and there'd be times we talked to him four times a day. It just depends on the issue. I'm not that heavily involved in immigration, so the last couple of weeks has been a little bit slow. Heavily involved with things like health care and taxes and the budget, so there'd be times where you're in there several times a day. And who else in the cabinet or at the cabinet rank level do you interact with most? Secretary Mnuchin, um, the economic team is myself, Mnuchin, uh, Larry Kudlow, and then Kevin Hassett, who runs the uh, Council of Economic Advisors. And that is a really, really good team uh, of folks, and we probably interact the most as we um, consult with the president on the, the larger economic issues. Some people here may be aware that Stephanie Rule, my former co-anchor, in fact, was supposed to be occupying this seat, but she's down in Texas covering the border issue, for those of you who don't know, about 90 minutes ago, the president said he would sign an executive order today on family separation. Um, I have to follow his Twitter account. I really do. So. <laughs> that was actually on television, but I was suppose it? It, it made it to Twitter in no time. Um, how difficult has it been uh, for the administration to manage this issue, and what role have you played in it as director of the OMB? In immigration, or in, um, in these recent days? Uh, again, not not we've not really involved. The neat thing about my job is that we we run the. For those of you who don't know what OMB does, don't feel bad. Nobody does, but we're sort of the management consulting firm for the president. We make sure that 
the agencies pretty much do what the president wants them to do. Um, and we use the budget as one of the tools to accomplish that. So we use the budget to sort of help manage, hence the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and we really get down into the weeds of how things function. So we're in the mechanics of how the government functions, not really in the, in the policy formation. So when I say we're not that heavily involved in immigration, we're not. When the president comes to me and says, I want to build a wall, how much does it cost? I get that. Mm -hmm. The president says, okay, we need this many number of detention beds. How much does that cost? By the way, the beds cost us. It costs us $1,250 per night per person um, to, 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 to hold somebody. Um, that's uh, because we provide them with health care and, and education and psychological counseling, I think. Anyway, what is it, what is so it those, are the question, those are the questions I get. I don't get really the policy questions. I get the how do we implement this, how much is it going to cost, how long does it take? Well, can I ask you policy questions since you're here? Well, I sure. You have a lot of experience in government. Is zero tolerance good immigration policy? Uh, I think it is, yeah. Uh, keep in mind, that there's, there's been a couple of stories back and forth, and, and a lot of what you hear, and I hate to say this, is not entirely true. Um, in fact, um, people always ask me when I was in Congress, how do you get your information? I'm like, that's one of the biggest challenges I have, is that, and no offense to your former uh, counsel, but I'll try to be even-handed here. Um, if you only watch MSNBC, you're not going to get the entire truth, and if you only watch Fox, you're not going to get the entire truth. And it becomes very difficult to try and find out what's happening in the middle. Here's what's happening in terms of, of the logistics on immigration, okay? There has been a policy change, yes, but the policy is not to separate children from their families. The policy has been zero tolerance on if you come into the border illegally, okay? If you if, put aside, if you cross at a border crossing and take amnesty, that's not the group of people we're talking about. If you cross the border between the ports of entry, which is illegal, um, our zero tolerance is now that we are going to charge you with that crime, okay? That is the policy change. Um, after that, the law kicks in, and the law is that if you get detained and charged with a crime, you don't get to keep your kids around. So if I drive home drunk tonight and I get arrested and I get charged with that crime and they throw me in jail, they will not let my kids come and spend the night with me. That is the law, okay? So when, uh, you watch one side of the argument, they say this is all about policy. You watch another side, they say it's all about law. The actual fact of the matter is it's actually a combination. Somewhere in the, the middle. I suspect there are a few people in this room who would like to know how you feel about it which is to say, is something that appears to be or may in fact be humane still the right thing to do? Uh, humane or inhumane? Inhumane. Um, uh, whether or not it, is it, is it humane, it is what we do to American citizens. Again, if, if you... No, 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 we as American citizens don't separate children from their family. But we do, and that's my point. That's what we do. How, do you have kids? I do. How old are they? They're 18 and, and about 16. Okay, so the 16 is still home. I have three 18-year-olds, and they don't care if they're with me. They're gone, right? Um, but your 16-year-old is still home, right? She and is. If, if you get arrested tonight for shooting me, okay, we are going to detain you, or we're going to put you in, in jail, and we are going to separate you from your child. That is, that's the law. That's what we do. Your kids don't get to go with you to detention, to prison. And that's what we are doing on the border. You can, you can say what you want to about the policy, which is the zero tolerance, which is mm -hmm. different than the previous administration, but not on the execution of the law. So I, I, I refuse to accept the premise that somehow that's inhumane when it's the exact same thing we do to our own citizens, and we do it for good reasons. We don't want those folks in prison. Well, there are some distinctions to be drawn. If I end up shooting you, it's not going to happen. And I end up going We're to prison. We're not done yet. It may be we, so. Um, someone tried to shoot me on the snatch. My shooting. child, my 16-year-old, isn't going to be in something that looks like a cage. What if she was three, okay? And what if you were a single parent? Where would she go then? You would know better than me. Uh, and the answer is, I honestly don't know where they go. By the way, I've been to the to the detention centers. You should go. Go. I, I know maybe your. I don't know if your network has gone, but go. I've seen them. When you say it's cages. Um, there is, uh, what do they call it, cyclone fencing, um, but it's, it's air conditioned, again, they have services. It sounds like we're keeping folks as zoo animals, and that's just not, that doesn't help a discussion of the issues. When you come in and say, you're keeping people, human beings in cages, okay? It's not factually accurate, and it doesn't help a debate on the underlying issues. So again, I, I, I reject the premise. I'm happy to talk that's about fair. immigration, um, but I think it helps when we do it, in, in, in language that doesn't automatically uh, accuse the other person of being the devil, and that works both ways. Well, we're not going to spend this whole conversation on immigration, so let me move to another issue that I think is of interest to this audience, and which this administration has made a signature initiative, and that's trade. 
I think it's fair to assume that there are a lot of people in this room in business who either have or want to develop global markets for their products. Yep. And they might be alarmed by the aggressive posture on trade that this administration has taken. Some of them, I think it's fair to say some of those people are in this room. What do you say to those people? Um, it's, a good, it's a good question. It's a fair question. Here's what I say to folks. Um, everything else that we've done, if you like the president, you don't like the president, you like the president's style, you don't like the president's style, if you're in the business of business, I think I can make the case that pretty much everything he's done, let's put trade aside for a second, everything else he's done has been good for business. That all the policies that you've heard us talk about have been good for the American economy. It's what the president ran on, it's what he wants to accomplish. So you talk about our, uh, our energy policy, again, you may not like it, you may not be what you personally prefer, but it's done to be good for business and I think everybody acknowledges that. Taxes, the same way. Um, the stuff we're doing on regulation, we get a chance to talk about that some today. It's all been designed to help the economy. So if you accept that premise, then why does everybody automatically or seem to assume that on trade we're doing something that's exactly, that's intentionally bad for the economy? Uh, I wish the president would get more credit for what he's done and have some credibility when he looks at people and said, look, this is our trade policy. And is it going to be rough for a while? Yeah, but we're trying to get people to change their activities, change their behavior. And you don't get China to change its behavior on something like technology transfer by simply asking them politely. You have to encourage people to change their behavior, and sometimes that gets a little rough. Uh, and so that's what we're doing. So negotiating tactic. This is, we are interested in having better, uh, my guess is everybody out here is in some way attached to, to, the, to the business of IT and IP, okay? And you, I think, recognize more than, than, than most folks the challenges of dealing with a country like China where you have forced technology transfer. We want to stop that, okay? If somebody else has a better idea on how to stop that, other than trying to sort of make it point clear to them that it's not in their best interest to continue that, which is what our trade policies are doing, we'd be happy to chat about that. But everything we have done is aimed at improving the economy, and everything we're doing on trade is aimed at improving the economy. Again, you may disagree with the tactics, but I hope the president at least gets credit for uh, aiming the, 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 the country in the right direction economically. What about the potential for unintended consequences, like, say, China deciding that it's going to stop buying U.S. Treasuries? Um, that one doesn't bother me so much. Um, no? But yeah, unintended, by the way, unintended consequences are, it, it's sort of like, it's a counterfactual, right? I mean, how do you anticipate unintended? Well, they may respond right. in that way. By definition, an unintended consequence is one you don't, you can't foresee. Uh, but if they do respond that way, I've also heard the argument about them selling the, the treasuries that they hold. Um, first of all, a couple different things. The decision to buy or not buy, uh, they don't do it to help us. They do not buy our treasuries to help keep our interest rates down. They do not buy our treasuries so that we can run a deficit and, and, fund, and, and run the government. They buy our treasuries because it's good for them, by definition. Okay? Um, and if they chose not to do that, then by definition that would be bad for them. So that has to weigh on their decision making. As to selling the treasuries, um, I hear a lot of concern about that. Keep in mind, they don't own nearly as much as everybody says. Everybody thinks they own, you know, 25% of our debt. That number's actually not right. The largest holder of our debt is actually the, the Federal Reserve. And, and that, and this is important, is a card you can only play once. Um, once that's played, you, you can't do it. The threat of selling is actually a more powerful uh, tool than actually selling. So I don't worry uh, too much about that. Do, do I worry about, uh, about unintended consequences? Yes, but I'm not sure what those are. Well, I, I said unintended in the sense that trade policy is intended to achieve an outcome in trading terms. Yeah. It's certainly not intended to poke the bear to respond in another way. I'm assuming not. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, you, this, okay, let's, let's get let's down to a binary decision, okay? Did you want to leave it the way it was or not, okay? And if you want to leave it the way it was, it's fine, then anything we're going to do is be perceived as being wrong. If you wanted to change it, okay, then you might disagree with the tactics, but not the strategy. Do you and, like the tactics, by the way? Uh, the, I, I, I have had a really, when I joined the team, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm described by many, sometimes myself, as a right-wing nut job. Um, I'm a founding member of the Freedom Caucus. I'm a fairly conservative person. Um, and when I joined the Trump team, um, I knew that the president wasn't as fiscally conservative historically as I was. Not that many people are. Um, and I asked uh, one of the senior advisors to the team before I took the job, look, is there going to be a place on this team for dissent? Um, because if the president's looking for a yes man, I am not, we are not, this is not going to work. And they said, not only does he want it, he's actively seeking it out, which is why he offered you the job. And I say that to say this. Uh, we have had some of the most 
vibrant and energetic discussions in the Oval Office about trade than we have had since I've been there. Um, we have a wide variety of opinions. Those of you who know Larry Kudlow, I know you know him professionally, knows where he stands on trade. If you don't know Peter Navarro, he's about as far away from, from Mr. Kudlow as you can possibly get. All of those opinions, all of the, the facts that you can bring to back up your opinion, have been laid out for the President of the United States. I have participated in that. I'm probably not as much of a, of a free trader as, as Larry, and I'm not as much of a, say, a protectionist, for lack of a better word, as Mr. Navarro is. I'm, I, grew, I was trained as a classically trained uh, Western economist, so I think I can explain free trade to people, but I also grew up and am from the South, so I've seen the impact of trade deals which I, can, I think I can convince you it's not free trade, it's negotiated trade, but I've seen what's happened in textiles and furniture, so I sort of have a different perspective on it. All of those perspectives have been laid out. Is, it what, is the policy that we are undertaking the policy that I would be doing if I were President of the United States? No, but it also is not the policy that uh, uh, Peter Navarro would be doing or that Larry Kudlow were doing if he were President. None of us is President. The President is the President, so what we do is we lay out the arguments so that he gets to decide. And from somebody like myself, who wins some and loses some, um, it really is satisfying to know at least you've been in the Oval Office and you've been able to make your case. And if the President decides to go another way, that's okay, because he's the boss, and he got elected to make those decisions. And it's much easier to defend something that is not 100% what you would have done if you got to participate in the process. And I feel like um, I have been able to participate in the process. The philosophy I bring to the trade issue and other issues has been part of the process. So yeah, I have absolutely no difficulty going on television, coming on stage, and defending our, our policies um, because I've been involved with them, and I trust the president is, is, like I said before, doing what he thinks is best for the American economy. There's another issue that may concern or be of interest to this audience. FinTech at some point, I would imagine. We'll get there. <laughs> These are business people, right? And you occupy two very important roles as they concern business and the economy. Yeah. So one of the things that helps on which Western democracy and capitalism stands or rests is institutions. And this president has been fairly free in, let's call it, attacks on certain institutions, federal institutions, multilateral institutions, and the net effect of those, mm -hmm. I'm calling them attacks, might be that he has sown some mistrust in things like the FBI or the justice system, or perhaps even mistrust in allies of the United States mm -hmm. like Germany or Canada. What do you think of, of those things? Yeah. And what should people here, how should people here interpret those common statements and tweets by the president. Let me, those are a bunch of questions. Let me mm -hmm. see if I can answer the big one about the institutions. Um, maybe one of the stories, and, and Trey Gowdy is a, a close friend of mine. In fact, I was just talking to the president this morning, and Trey came up. And I keep telling him, because two weeks ago, Trey was lauded on the left as being a critic of the president. Now today, he's being excoriated or lauded on the right <laughs> for being a defender of the president. And what I've told the president, same thing I tell you, is Trey shoots it right down the middle. And if he were sitting here, and he's a former federal prosecutor, he knows this business much more than I do. And if he were sitting here, what he would say is, what he's seen inside the FBI stuns and frightens him. And that maybe, maybe, a little distrust of an institution is a healthy thing from time to time. In fact, the country was actually founded on the distrust of government, an institution, and that maybe a little cynicism, a healthy cynicism about our institution is a very American thing to have. And maybe uh, we are finding that the Department of Justice and the FBI are not uh, the straight down the middle arbiters that we thought that they were. It may turn out that they're exactly what we've always hoped and wanted them to be, but maybe what we've done, what's happened in the last couple of, of, of months uh, with the various investigations at the FBI is exposed that uh, the possibility that that's not the case. And if it's not the case, let's fix it so that it can, again, be the same institution that we all want and need for it to be. Uh, as to dealing with our, our neighbors, um, I'll give you an example. And again, you, you've asked me a very soaring sort of uh, high rhetorical question. I'm going to answer it with a, with a detail, which I know is rude, but I'm going to do it this way. Um, Canada, uh, I don't know if you all, anybody here is in the, actually ships products or services across the border. Uh, uh, there's an issue right now with Canada, and it's real. And the issue is this, is that um, if uh, Canada wants to ship something here uh, across the border, we have what's called the de minimis rule. 
And if they want to ship something to us in small amounts, and for us it's $800. So if you have something in Canada, you're selling these, and you want to cross the border into the United States, if, you, if it's less than $800, uh, you don't have to worry about any of the tariffs, any of the registration. It just, it just passes. It's a de minimis exception to our various trade agreements, right? That's fine. Sounds good. I like that. If you want to ship this back to Canada, the de minimis rule is $15.85. Does that sound fair? Does that sound equitable? Does that sound even? It doesn't to me. So while many folks, and the reason I, I, I tell that story is that, it, is that, to challenge that, is that a challenge of an institution? Is it undermining alliances? Or is it simply saying, hey, that, that doesn't, this doesn't look right. Can we fix that? And if we are really good friends and good allies, and we are, uh, I believe we can and will fix it. Um, but so I, I, I understand the, the, the sort of the, the, the soaring rhetorical questions of are we undermining democracy? No, we're trying to fix this. Um, and some people interpret that, many of them because they don't like the president, as something much greater than it is. And what it is, is trying to sort of level the playing field. In that example, there's other examples, we can go through various countries and so forth, but that's, that's the best way I know to answer your question. You described yourself as a right-wing nutshell. Uh, job, yes. <laughs> nutshell? I don't know what that is. Yeah, I yes. think you did say that, but maybe you meant just... Not job. Not. Yeah, <laughs> no. um, what's your philosophy on regulation? How would you describe that? Um, I'll, I'll answer that one this way. Um, I, at, the, at, the, at the Bureau, which used to be the CFPB, now is the BCFP, although I will admit I fall into the old habits from time to time. Um, not a lot of folks know this. We've got actually five mandates. And as a bureaucrat, I would like to enforce the law. I hope that's what we all want our bureaucrats to do. There's the law, go out and enforce it. If you want to make the law, you can go to that building down on the hill and you can change the law, but if you want to enforce the law, which is what we should do over here, we'd like you to enforce it. We have five mandates. Y'all are all familiar with one of them, I would imagine, which is to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices. That's there on the list. Not as many of you probably know that the next thing in the list is to uh, make sure that the markets are free of unduly and unburdensome uh, regulations. That's what I want to do. Um, I want to. I want to do all. I want to enforce all of the law. So generally speaking, yes. As a conservative Republican, I'd like a light hand when it comes to regulation because I do believe in the markets. Um, I think the markets, by the way, have a bad reputation. I don't know how we allow this to happen. I used to get asked back home in South Carolina, "Why do you defend the markets?" I'm like, "That's easy. You're the market." I mean, what, you go into a store and, and, and decide choose between regular orange juice and organic orange, orange juice. That is the market. I, tr I trust you. I don't trust the government to tell you which of those two you have to buy. I do have faith in the market because I, that means ultimately I have faith in individuals. So yes, as a conservative Republican, um, my natural bent is to be light-handed when it comes to regulatory actions. That is not to say that they are not necessary. I'm not a wild, wild west guy. Um, people accuse me of time to time of being libertarian. Um, I, I, I've always said as soon as libertarians figure out they, they can't run naked down Main Street, they might have a chance in this country. Um, uh, so that's not where I am. Um, at the same time, when it comes to my official duties, I will enforce the law. If the law says I shall, I shall protect consumers, I will do it. If the law says I will go find and make sure there's not unduly and unburdensome, uh, over, overly burdensome regulation, I will do that as well. At least in some corners of fintech, there's room for abuse. Mm -hmm. Some fintech companies are engaged in non-bank lending. Yep. And it's a statement of fact that there are two extremes to regulation. There's the one extreme where there is none, and there's the other extreme where there's too much. Where do you draw the line? How do you know? But that's the challenge, right? And as we've been working on this, um, I, for those of you who don't know me, and there's no reason for you to know me, um, I was one of the founding members of the uh, the Bitcoin caucus and the blockchain caucus uh, at Congress. I our, our, think our, our roles were a stunning five or six different people who cared about those topics a couple of years ago. Um, and we knew at an early, a, an early point in, say, uh, Bitcoin, that with, as with any developing technology, we needed to find that sweet spot. Because if you don't do enough regulation, don't do any, you run the risk of having major embarrassments that chill the market for future innovation. Mm -hmm. um, something really bad, like if Mt. Gox became a regular occurrence, dramatically undermines confidence in the markets and prevents innovation. On the other hand, if we overregulate it and discourage people from entering the marketplace, that has bad consequences too. So you are looking for that Goldilocks down the middle, which is the, the, the attitude that we've brought to the Bureau 
Um, we're opening up the Office of uh, Innovation. We used to have a thing called Project Catalyst. We've changed it now. Uh, I think we'll be announcing next week a, a, high, a formal uh, leader to that group um, to try and, and within the Bureau to make sure, okay, um, we're going to continue to enforce the law. And to the, to the extent you're in the fintech business, of course, the law still applies to you. Uh, an example I got, uh, there was a, a situation, we, we, we take complaints, not that many, um, relatively speaking, about, about fintech and crypto. Um, and we had some complaints from people saying that they couldn't get access to their, to their cryptocurrencies, okay? That would be a problem regardless of whether or not it's a new technology. If you go down to the, to the Bank of America branch and can't get your money out, that is a problem. Okay, so there's a situation where the law is functioning properly. That if, if this, even though this is a new and innovative technology, it's a non-banking system, it's whatever, if people still can't get access to their own money, that's a problem. So the law is functioning correctly there. What we're interested in making sure is that that is what happens, and you don't have a cir circumstance where because it's new and because it's innovative, that an application of an old law gives you an absurd or unintended result. Okay? That if for some reason, if we're looking at you, and the only way we can look at you is through the lens of a bricks and mortar financial institution, and because we do that, it has this perverse and absurd result, that's what we're trying to identify and to prevent. So the consumers are still protected, they still get access to their money, for example, but that at the same time, we don't discourage people from entering the market through absurd applications of laws and regulations. If we called mile zero where the CFPB was, I'm going to use the acronym, sure. when you took it over, and mile 100 where you wanted to get in reshaping it, where are you now? Do I just in fintech or all over? Uh, both. Okay. I'll, let, I'll answer the, 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 the larger question first. Um, folks ask me all the time, what are my goals? Is my goal to shut the place down? My problem, of course, in shutting the place down is that I'm a, a good conservative Republican, and good conservative Republicans who are in the bureaucracy don't make law. Okay? We just don't. Um, we've got this natural proclivity to just want to enforce it. So here's the law. The law says I shall exist, and I shall do these five things. So I shall, we will exist, and we will do those five things. I'm not going to shut the building down. We're not setting it on fire. I know it's really disappointing to some of my right-wing friends. Um, but the law is what the law is, and until the law changes, we're going to enforce it. So what does that mean it's going to change at the Bureau? Here's how I, I sum it up, and I'm going to use some soaring rhetoric now. Um, we are still uh, Elizabeth Warren's baby. Uh, until we break that, we will never be considered to be on par with the other gold standard regulators. You don't know who started the SEC, and you probably don't care. I don't know who did, okay? I don't know who started the FDIC, and I don't care. I know when an FDIC rule comes out, um, it's got sort of this imprimatur of, of, of credibility to it. And the SEC will change from time to time when, when elections uh, go one way or the other. Thank goodness that elections have consequences. That's why we have them. But it doesn't have these wild swings because it's got a five-person commission, and and I'm you know it's, the bureau is different about all of that. We are still very much associated with our founding, the circumstances under which we were founded, the principles by which we were founded, and the person who founded us in essence, which was Elizabeth Warren. And what I'm trying to get us is is beyond that. Um, and I compare it to the other agency that I run, which is the Bureau of the Office of Ma or the Office of Management Budget. Um, which is probably within the executive branch the gold standard when it comes to administration. I have people on my team who have been there since the Carter and Reagan administrations. People don't leave OMB. They are professional bureaucrats. They will work as hard on day one for Donald Trump as they did on the last day for uh, President Obama, and they will work as they are exactly what you want from bureaucrats. They've learned how to transition. The Bureau has never been through a transition before, whether it be a presidential transition or a transition in the philosophy of the, of the director. So we're going to learn how to do that. And we are going to learn to be a professional gold standard financial regulator who protects uh, individuals, protects consumers, protects markets, uh, and does all the things the statute wants us to do. Can you do that? with the law as written, yes. or does it require the changes that you've asked Congress to consider? The changes that we've asked Congress to consider, and some of them include putting us on appropriations and uh, making my position terminable by the president at will, uh, go more towards that wild swing that we have, okay? And the authority that I have as an individual. I'm not making this up. It says on October 1st of next year, I can walk down the street to the Federal Reserve with a piece of paper that says, please give me $700 million, and they will give it to me and they will not ask me what I'm doing with it. That's not right, um, and I hope to fix that. There's other things I can do by myself that would, would probably 
uh, frighten you and, and, and say, wait a second, that's not right that one person has that much authority. So we're going to run it differently, um, but you cannot and should not rely on the, the personality and the philosophy of the person in charge to get good government. You should rely on the structure of government, the systems of government, uh, to, and the institutions to get good government. And that's what I'm trying to do through our legislative changes, make the institution more sound and credible in its nature, not just because one person happens to be in charge one day. You're still the acting director. Your successor has been nominated. Yes. If she isn't confirmed, how long are you prepared to serve in that role? Um, until, well, I mean, the way it works is this, is that I, I, I was going to turn into a pumpkin uh, day after tomorrow. Um, On Friday. But since right. she, this is the president nominated Kathy Craninger, who's going to be fantastic uh, in this position, uh, I'm allowed to stay now until she's confirmed or denied by the Senate. If she's denied, then I think there's a, a, a window where the president can reconfirm somebody else. So the bottom line is this, is that in the extreme case, and I doubt very seriously, do not think it will come to this, I could stay till the end of the first term of the presidency. Right, and then 2020. Be, and then be renewed after that if, if he wins the second term. Um, my guess is um, that the, uh, I, I, maybe I'm naive, and I, I hope that all my naivete has been driven out of me by eight years in Washington, D.C., but put yourself in the shoes of Elizabeth Warren. Um, anybody's got to be better than me, right? Um, so why not confirm Ms. Craninger and just be done with it because that starts the five-year clock to whoever the next, uh, ever the next uh, director is. So what do you think is going to happen? I think she'll probably be confirmed um, sometime in the late or early fourth quarter of this calendar year. Well, that will give this audience another director of the CFPB um, to hear from. Please join me in thanking Mick Mulvaney. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Thanks very much. Are we going this way? Yes. <laughs>